So my name is Dominic Spill. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, I, that's exactly what I've come here to talk about, is open source spectrum monitoring. Um, I uh, work for a company called Great Scott Gadgets. Uh, so this is me. Um, in case anyone can't see my face, this is what I look like. Uh, I work on uh, open source hardware and software. Um, I mostly work on things like Ubertooth, which is a Bluetooth sniffing tool, um, Great Fit, which is a hardware hacking tool we're working on at the moment, and uh, HackerF, um, which is this software-defined radio peripheral that I think many of you would have heard of, and I've, I think they may have mentioned in the previous talk, but I'm not sure. Um, and I wrote a little site called FCC.io, which is not covered in this, uh, in this slide deck at all, but is, is something that I might try and mention it once or twice um, about uh, open source intelligence when it comes to radio devices. Uh, so here are some of the products we make, uh, and specifically today I'm going to be using HackerF, which is this big one in the middle. Uh, it's a software-defined radio. It has a um, kind of uh, 1 megahertz to 6 gigahertz tuning range. It grabs 20 megahertz of bandwidth, and it's all open source, including the hardware and the firmware. And what we're going to do here is uh, we've written some custom firmware to do some interesting things that you can uh, go and play with. So. What is spectrum monitoring? Well, as, um, as the introduction said, uh, you, someone plants a device within your organization, you want to be able to look for it, you want to be able to find it, you want to know it's there, um, you want to have a real, really good idea of whether or not those devices have been put there, what are people in your organization bringing in. Um, sometimes you want to specifically locate them, which is uh, not necessarily the, the direct theme of this today, but is... Uh, is certainly possible using some of these techniques. Um, and what we want to do is monitor the spectrum around us for new and different things. Now, if you work in an environment where you have a network, you might, hopefully, monitor your network for people adding devices to your, to your network. You monitor, monitor your Wi-Fi for people to connect, connecting to your Wi-Fi. So are you doing anything to monitor the fact that someone might bring in a transmitter that exfiltrates data over unlicensed uh, 900 megahertz or 433 bands? Um, do you know if people are doing that? Have you got any idea whether you would even know if someone did that and, uh, and brought that sort of uh, capability into your organization? And potentially, do you care? Uh, so, I mean, the people who should care are large organizations um, it's, it's just part of uh, monitoring your, your perimeter, monitoring your security. Um, it's, uh, there, are, there are companies that will sell you uh, solutions to do this. Um, this is not a, a brand new concept or anything. Uh, in fact, the previous speakers work for uh, Bastille, and I believe that's part of their offering. Um, and you know, they, they, there are all sorts of different ways to do this. Um, what we're looking at now are some of the available tools to go and look at the spectrum around you and your organization. Um, we use it specifically for uh, reverse engineering within Great Scott Gadgets. We like doing uh, wireless reverse engineering and hardware hack um, radio hacking. Uh, and so we'll pick up a device and we'll, we'll have this little piece of IoT gear in front of us and we'll switch it on. And then the first question is, well, what protocol is it talking? What's it communicating over? And you can not always trust the box. I mean, we have seen um, while, uh, electric skateboards that had a controller, and the controller had a switch on it that said Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, and when you switched it into the Bluetooth mode, it was definitely not Bluetooth. When you switched into the Wi-Fi mode, it was Bluetooth. Uh, and the, the Bluetooth mode was some proprietary 2.4 gigahertz. And uh, we had no idea. Uh, this is uh, Richo, Healy, and um, Mike Ryan's work from a couple of years ago. They did a great DEF CON talk on it. Um, but they, uh, they were baffled by this for, for a short time before they pulled out a hacker app and started looking at the spectrum and saying, well, it's probably 2.4 gigahertz if they've claimed to be Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So maybe we look there and we see, and like, they were flicking the switch backwards and forwards, and it's, it's definitely something going on. And then they, Mike Ryan looks at the screen and goes, that looks like Bluetooth. And so then he was able to start decoding it and, and things like that. But that took the, the fact that Mike had, uh, Mike Ryan had um, the ability to look at the screen and visually identify Bluetooth from, a, uh, from an FFT, which um, is pretty much what I'm going to show you today, that uh, I also have that ability. But hopefully, um, we're moving towards a place where other people have that ability, or automated tools do. And that's really um, 
the, the focus of where we want to get to um, starting from, from this baseline. So um, the other people are at right at the bottom here are radio operators. Can we just have a quick show of hands? Has anyone got their amateur radio license in the room? So a handful of people. Okay. Um, so I'm reliably informed that if you start transmitting on a on a channel that you shouldn't be, the amateur radio uh, operators will be the first people to track you down. Significantly before the FCC or Ofcom or whoever your governing body is, amateur radio operators are fantastic at finding interferers quickly, and uh, they get a, I think they get a kick out of this kind of ability to monitor wide bands of spectrum because they can look at who is transmitting and maybe whether or not they should be transmitting and, and obeying the rules. So um, the way we're going to do this is uh, well, really three steps. Uh, we're going to take a software-defined radio, we're going to perform an FFT, and then we're going to plot the output of that FFT. This is not particularly new. Um, RTL, uh, has anyone got one of these RTL SDR dongles, the little TV tuners? Excellent. There's a tool called RTL Power, which will pretty much do this for you. Uh, you combine that with a Python script called Heatmap, and it generates images for you that show you uh, a, a broad kind of sweep of, uh, of spectrum and, and where the power is. Um, and, and as I said previously, this isn't new, um, RTL Power and Heatmap, which I'll show you in a second, but also this is SatMap by Adam Laurie. Now what um, Adam did for this was he had a steerable satellite dish mounted on the roof of the building, and he tuned, he, uh, he steered the dish slightly, tuned uh, the full sweep of the frequency range of his receiver, looking for power, and then tuned the dish slightly again. So this this plot at the bottom of the screen here is um, west to east, tuning across the sky, and the frequency is uh, between 10.7 gigahertz and 13 gigahertz, I think. Um, those are all up in satellite ranges, I believe. Uh, and so he, he looked for where there was power on there, and then he made this map of the sky, um, uh, which he calls sat map or sky map, depending on um, which page you look at. And some of them are interesting. You've got these big transmitters um, which are on a bunch of different frequencies simultaneously. And they're probably your communication satellites, your TV satellites. But every now and again, you get something that's just, like, like just up here, this thing, very narrow transmitter, very narrow amount of, uh, of, of channels on there. So someone's gone to the effort and the cost of putting up a satellite just to communicate on that, um, on that frequency. So someone with money is communicating via their own satellite because they don't want to use existing communications technologies. So that might be an interesting one to go look at. Uh, so this morning I did this, this scan. This represents um, one hour, 53 minutes, which uh, heat map helpfully writes all over your image over here. Um, I should have remembered to turn that off before outputting the image. But this is a, a scan of what's going on uh, sweeping from um, pretty close to zero megahertz up to 1.7 gigahertz, which is the tuning range of, of this little RTL SDR dongle. Um, and this, is, all it does is it, it tunes to a frequency, takes a sample, runs an FFT to see where the power is, tunes to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and just sweeps across this, this spectrum. And then heat map ingests this data and, and spits out an image. And this gives you a really good idea of what's, what's around you. So we can see there are um, a lot of powerful transmitters that are, are pretty constant. Uh, some of those will be um, phone transmissions that'll be um, radio towers, there'll be, um, what is it, down, down here around 100 megahertz, we'll have broadcast FM, um, we'll probably have a couple of GSM networks and various other things like that. Uh, but you can also see, and again, I'll try and show you, up here we've got some very, very short, to be clear, it's frequency on the uh, x-axis, time on the y-axis. We've got some very, very short transmissions here and here and here. So they're much more likely to be, especially around 900 megahertz, uh, unlicensed things. Um, 900 megahertz unlicensed things shouldn't be being used in Europe, but in the same frequency band. But, um, but they are likely to be small devices. There's a fair chance from this that I could tell when the, um, the hotel staff came into my room to clean it, uh, especially if I were able to get up to 2.4 gigahertz. I'd probably spot their phone um, and things like that uh, when they entered the room. Now, we can do the same thing with HackerF. Um, but because we wanted to get good performance out of HackerF, what we did is wrote our own custom firmware for it. So custom, we control the firmware anyway. We wrote, our own, <laughs> wrote a modified firmware for it that uh, um, 
sweeps and does that retuning in firmware. So it retunes, takes a sample, retunes, takes a sample, retunes, takes a sample, and dumps all these back to the host. And this means we don't have the round trip time between the host and the over, over USB. Uh, we don't have that latency, so we can retune much more quickly. Um, and in fact, we were able to, we have to use a modified version of heat map because heat map assumes that when sweeping from the left to the right of your frequency range, um, it can use timestamps uh, uh, with a granularity of one second. And we're able to sweep our frequency range, which is zero megahertz to six gigahertz, in about 0.75 of a second. So we need a microsecond or around that um, timestamp resolution. Uh, so I, I ran at the same time as this RTL power heat map, I ran one for HackerF. Now we have a slight problem with resolution and the screen because this is the same map. Um, so this is the same, same width, but significantly more resolution in the, in the vertical axis. Um, this is a 62 meg PNG, uh, so I apologize for anyone who downloads the slides uh, because <laughs> it's in here twice. Um, and <laughs> as you can see, this, is this, is, um, this isn't the same width, sorry, I, I lied. This is uh, six gigahertz wide. So this is more than three times as wide as the previous image, and it's significantly higher because we're getting that much more data. Um, now, I have clearly slightly screwed up my, um, my power threshold on this because it looks a little bit uh, washed out. But you'll spot that there's an awful lot of noise a lot, awful lot more power here, if I hadn't blurred the whole thing. There's a reasonable amount of power here. We still have some interesting things down here. Uh, this is very spotty, um, which you cannot see unless you're as close as I am. Uh, but we have so much data, you need to get in there and, and, and look at it. Um, so we're able to receive, yeah, so, uh, six gigahertz of data in 0.7, uh, six gigahertz wide, wide bandwidth, where it was a sweep through the power on that in 0.75 seconds. So we have a lot more information to, to play with. But it's kind of interest, more interesting, potentially, to look at this stuff in real time. Like we, I took that sweep over the course of two hours. I then spent the rest of the day uh, trying to coax heat map into producing an image from it, uh, which I clearly failed to do at uh, reasonable power levels. Uh, turns out it's really important that you remember decibels are often negative, um, because <laughs> otherwise, if you think they're positive, everything's out of range. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is uh, Q Spectrum Analyzer, um, which should show up. Excellent. And if I go into my settings, I'm use HackerF Sweep, 20 megahertz. That's fine. So this is going to scan from 1 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, and hopefully should give us some output on the screen. Well, that is, it's not great, is it? So. I was hoping we'd see something more spiky there. But essentially, this is giving us real-time data. I've, I've screwed something up slightly with the uh, way these FFTs are calculated. Uh, but this, is, um, this should be showing us real-time data for that sweep. And every line on this waterfall is a, is a sweep. And we're getting it about just shy of once a second. And so we can start to pick out things in real time and see when they're actually transmitting and, and when they're not. And it would be great if this data looked good. Um, so I'm clearly not doing the FFT properly, but that's OK, because hopefully I'm going to be able to show another version of the same thing. Uh, to be clear, this is that original image. And we can zoom way in, way in. No, we can't, because. <sighs> Let it let down by my tools, which obviously is my fault. But okay, so that's fine. Uh, Q Spectrum Analyzer is actually a relatively good way of looking at this, but uh, as it turns out, I can't work it. Um, but uh, it might also be interesting to do um, to use some of the tools we're used to. So if anyone's played with software defined radio before, you've probably used uh, GNU Radio, GNU Radio Companion. You're used to various uh, visualization tools that that are in there. And it might be nice to get data into those. And um, previously, what we did, we tuned to a frequency, took some samples, perform performed an FFT, which gave us that frequency to power map that we could, we could plot. Now, the FFT is a reversible function. So we can convert the output of that power map back into samples. 
the question is why would we want to do this? When you're receiving radio, you bring the radio that you're receiving down to baseband, perform the FFT, and get a series of, of power values. But what we've got is six gigahertz wide of radio, and we get lots of uh, small bursts of samples that we've got down at baseband. So what the inverse FFT lets us do is take those FFTs and plot them next to each other as if we have a six gigahertz wide FFT, and then we run the inverse FFT, and instead of running it on small chunks of data lots of times, we run it on one big piece of data once, and we get back data that is six gigahertz wide. Is everyone with me so far? Is anyone with me so far? Yeah, vaguely. There are some, there are some hands up in the front from people who are slightly unsure that I know what I'm talking about. But uh, <laughs> this allows us to uh, view the data in me, there we go. In some of the tools that we, we already know. We already know and love. So it takes a little while to pre-calculate some things. We've got to set up some buffers for the inverse FFT. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it didn't just die. So it takes a, it takes a little while to, to just start this up. You can't particularly see what I just typed, but uh, here we go. And so what we should be able to see now is this is, again, doing the same thing, and it's sweeping um, over 6 gigahertz wide, and it's performing an FFT over every um, uh, 500 kilohertz, and then uh, plotting that using GR Phosphor. So you'll probably be used to this uh, if you've used software defined radio in the past couple of years to look for signals. This will show you, um, this is very good at showing you transient signals. And we can see uh, the 2.4 gigahertz section again. Again, like we're looking at 6 gigahertz wide here. We've got the zero point in the middle. So uh, negative 0.6, that's the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, and various other things. Down here, we're pretty close to DC, so we get a bit of uh, distortion. Um, and we'll see, I'm not sure what's at negative 2.4. Any suggestions from the front row? What's down at, what is that, negative? Uh, uh, that's about 900 megahertz, I guess. So that's probably where that spike is. I have no idea what around me is transmitting 900 megahertz, potentially the microphone. Um, and so we're able to view the data that we had captured as, as uh, disparate wide sweeps in kind of almost real time in, uh, in tools we know, and we're able to identify transient signals this way. Um, so if I run the same thing again, but I limit my frequency range, so my sample rate is... Uh, 100 megahertz wide now. This is the 2.4 gigahertz band, and it's sweeping the whole thing um, in uh, a much significantly quicker than that because it only has to do five hops to get the whole thing at 20 megahertz chunk. So you can see there are two large Wi Fi networks going on. There's a third which is kind of quieter. If I pull out my phone, hopefully I should be able to. Uh, fire up Bluetooth and have it scan, and you'll see it suddenly spits data all over the spectrum. But the interesting thing here is we're getting the vast majority of that data, as opposed to generally just pointing at a chunk of the 2.4 gigahertz band and seeing what comes in. We're getting these, these broad packets all over the place. So you can tell quite how much. It's actually very difficult to see on this screen with the, the lights on. But you, if you see the red line up at the top here, you can see those, those very transient spikes are showing up, and they should be showing up in the waterfall as well. And they are um, very short Bluetooth packets where it's searching for another device where my phone is, is, is trying to connect to, um, I don't know, a speaker or something that it, it's seen before. And so it's able to, um, it, it puts those across the, the whole bandwidth. So you can see them in the waterfall now that I've restarted the scan. Um, can anyone actually see that, or is it completely washed? Oh, okay. I'm struggling from this angle to see it, but I can see it on my screen, which is not helpful to you. Um, so, but those those, uh, um, those bursts are, are very quick and they're transient unless you're looking in the right place. I mean, uh, 10 years ago when I was trying to build the first, uh, or our first uh, software-defined uh, radio implementation for Bluetooth, I had to, um, you know, point to a, an, at the time, eight megahertz wide chunk of bandwidth and just hope that Bluetooth so I stroll past at some point. Whereas with this, I'm able to go and look at where it is in the, 
in the spectrum. And like for Bluetooth, it's all over the place, so it's probably not such a big deal. But last year, we were trying to um, reverse engineer some little wireless uh, quadcopters that were 2.4 gigahertz transmitters. And they claimed to be 2.4 gigahertz frequency hopping. And um, we were able to use techniques like this to go and look at the whole band and work out where they were hopping to and which channels they were on and, and so on and so forth, because we were able to monitor a much wider section of the band. And so for this, if you're um, in charge of looking at uh, the radio transmissions around an organization, if you're concerned about people bringing in 2.4 gigahertz transmitters that are you know, IoT devices, devices that they are not supposed to be bringing in, you can monitor this and you know that these are your two valid Wi-Fi networks. So if a third one pops up somewhere, you might have to start asking questions. If you see things, um, just a, a narrowband transmitter at one point in the, in the um, frequency range at some point, you know there's a fair chance that that is not, it's not Wi-Fi, it's not Bluetooth, so it's possibly some other 2.4 gigahertz transmitter that someone's brought into your organization. And like maybe it's someone bringing in a little quadcopter to play with, or maybe it's someone exfiltrating all your company's data. Um, but I'd want to know which. So that is uh, inverse FFTs, and that's pretty close to the end of, end of what I actually have to show. Um, Oh yeah, let's try looking at that in Inspectrum. Uh, so there, there's a slight problem with Inspectrum and, and doing this technique, which is Inspectrum doesn't support uh, greater than 32 bits of frequency range, so I have to lie to it and claim that I'm a much narrower signal than I am. Um, because otherwise it doesn't understand six gigahertz of bandwidth. This is the uh, wide scan that I showed you earlier. This is part of the one, uh, a subset of the really wide suite from earlier. So you can see my power levels are kind of off a little bit, but again, we can go in and we can look at some of these, um, these packets and, and you can see there's something transmitting here, which is uh, very spotty. You can see a reflected image here, which is probably an alias of the same thing. Um, and hopefully I should be able to zoom in on some of these things. Let's, uh, I was really hoping I'd be able to see more detail on these, but uh, apparently not. So uh, in some cases, what you'll be able to do is use Inspectrum to go and look at uh, and visually identify things like the modulation on these, um, things like try and alter my power level. So <laughs> this is not a working demo. I'm sorry about that. I was really hoping it would be. Uh, so sometimes you're able to visually from this uh, look at an image and in Inspectrum and you can literally look at something and you say, hey, it's on this frequency and I see it's on this frequency and the one next, like, you know, it's switching between the two. It's probably frequency shift keying. Uh, if you see that it's a fairly dense block of power across a wide band of frequencies, it's quite possibly something like OFDM that, that just dumps a, a, a fairly solid, like well-edged block of power across uh, a number of frequencies. Um, let me try a different file and see if we get any better luck, otherwise I will go on to, to wrapping up. Now well, that looks basically the same, doesn't it? This is the... Uh, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum earlier today. And the problem with doing 2.4 gigahertz at HackerCon is um, it's basically all power. Uh, so, I mean, if everyone could have just agreed to turn off all of their devices earlier today for half an hour, it would have been great. But sadly, I don't think I'm going to be able to show this in Inspectrum properly. Um, but maybe I will try and capture a file in my hotel room later and show it to people offline tomorrow. Um, so, so the idea there is, is we can um, pick out, we can visually pick out uh, packets and data uh, transmission types and look at what kind of radios might be transmitting and you can get a fairly good idea for what's transmitting, uh, what type of device it is from the type of radio connection it uses uh, quite often. Um, there's an awful lot of low power things that will use 2FSK in um, ISM bands. Uh, if you go and look at the appropriate bands, you'll see things like GSM. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, we'd like to, what, basically what this, uh, this uh, presentation is about is trying to show which tools exist and where we'd like to take them next. So that's what I'd like to talk about for just another minute or two. 
which is we would like to be able to have uh, the capture and the visualization and the analysis all in one tool. We'd like to build an open source tool, preferably, that will allow us to uh, receive that 60 gigahertz of bandwidth and then uh, when we want to drill down into, uh, you know, we identify a signal that looks interesting or, or, um, or novel or, or, or different and we can drill down into it and go and, go and take a look at I mean, what kind of modulation is it using. Let's do, um, let's do a spectrum plot to see if we can tell what kind of modulation it's using. Let's try and decode it in some way. Let's try and uh, take a capture and, and dump it out to, uh, to something like Inspectrum where we can start uh, playing around with uh, processing it, filtering it, demodulating it, so on and so forth. Um, the other thing is we've recently been experimenting with an antenna switching board for HackRF that will allow us to switch up to four antennas on the front end of it from, again, from the firmware, which means we'll be able to perform pseudo Doppler experiments with the, uh, using the, um, the same sort of techniques. And if we're able to synchronize the switching of the antennas with the uh, dumping of the, the buffers back to the host, we'll be able to perform uh, direction finding at the same time as sweeping that whole band. So while you'd lose some uh, performance across the band, you'd be able to uh, gain some information about the direction of the signal. Um, so that is, that is on our to-do list. There are three of those boards at the moment. Uh, one's in Scotland and one's in South Africa and the other one's on my desk and all three of us need to uh, get on with doing some work with them. Um, uh, so I just want to thank um, uh, everyone at Great Scott Gadgets who uh, unfortunately I told about the stream so they're watching now. Uh, so thanks to Mike Taylor and Elizabeth. Uh, also Mike Walters who is... Um, who uh, originally came up with some of the concept for HackerF Sweep. He had a, a really cool project at EMF Camp last year where he plotted the six gigahertz of bandwidth uh, using UV lasers on a, a piece of glow-in-the-dark material. So you got that onion skin fading effect naturally as, the, uh, as it responded to the UV light, which is kind of cool. Uh, and uh, so thank you to him, thank you to all his hard work and Mike and everyone else. Um, these are probably the two most interesting URLs for this. One is HackerF, where our firmware changes are and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, the other is uh, Q Spectrum Analyzer, which um, does actually give you a really interesting view of the spectrum. I've clearly misconfigured mine at some point while experimenting over the past couple of days. Um, but you can use either of those. If you want to use heat map with uh, HackerF Sweep, at the moment you have to use a modified version that we built, but we're hoping to get that pull request pushed upstream this week. And I will take any questions because I have two minutes left. Um, so you showed the heat map, uh, no, uh, the spectrum for uh, using the RTL STR, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a gap in between. Is it due to the uh, some RTL STRs having a gap in the frequency range, or is it because of? Uh, I mean, this is yeah. This is a really. You mean this section here? Yeah. It's it's a really big patch to not have anything in it. I will admit there are a couple of little little things in it. It, uh, I honestly don't know. This is I, I literally took the RTL SDR out of the packet this morning yeah, okay. um, for the first time, so I have no idea if this one has uh, gaps in its frequency range um, uh, that are causing that problem. But I suspect it's quite a quiet band as it is. Um, uh, can anyone think of anything between one gigahertz and one point four that I would see in this hotel front row? I'm looking at you. No, no. It might just be quiet, um, but it. it uh, there is definitely, if you get up close to it, some uh, some uh, transmissions in there. So I, I'm not entirely sure whether the gaps in in receive are on this radio or if there are any. So I couldn't tell you. I'm sorry. Thanks. Yeah, Mark. So I, I, I'm just curious when the hacker up is sweeping. Like, what's the the um, like the duty cycle at any one given frequency that it would it would see? So so what we do is um, most of the <laughs> We, we can increase the duty cycle um, based on, on how much data we want to capture, but, but reasonably um, what we do is we tune to a frequency. We, we're pulling, pulling back data at um, uh, 20 meg, 40 megahertz. Let me try that again. We're pulling back data at 480 megabits normally, um, and that is made up of 16K buffers. Um, so if you can do the maths to work out how long a buffer lasts, um, what we do is we tune, we wait for two buffers in length, um, which is a very short time. 
in order to allow the tuning to settle and then we just capture one buffer and we're literally operating on the last uh, n number of samples of that buffer and that buffer is uh, the n in that case is the width of our FFT. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Okay, if there's no more question that I would like to close the ComSec for today. Thank you all for joining and attending. Um, I've been asked also to tell you if you're going to leave now, if you're not staying anymore, but if you're going on your way, that you shouldn't go through the main entrance, but look, and you'll be given directions downstairs where you can exit. So please follow them. Thank you all for being here and see you again either tomorrow or next time.